Um, so um, uh, I have uh, 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 the slides on online in case you you want to. Uh, it wasn't a very mnemonic uh, tiny URL, but it came out as Mr. Export Gen 8 for some reason. So that's easy to remember. <laughs> uh, all right. So um, I am. Um, uh, uh, right now, uh, teaching at EL as an instructional faculty, um, I am from India and um, in Calcutta, grew up in Calcutta, and then I um, taught digital humanities as, as a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania and helped with the design of uh, summer curriculum in digital humanities at the University of California, Berkeley, moved to Singapore, uh, where I was teaching for four years, and now I'm back in EL. So in course of this um, itinerant uh, nomadic academic life, especially during the time that I spent in, in Singapore, it occurred to me that um, in the humanities generally, we are um, usually uh, very concerned about bringing our own experiences and our students' experiences to bear upon our um, pursuits, and, and especially in pedagogy. Not so much in the natural sciences, and digital humanities, because of its nature, has occupied, I think, a space where we kind of uh, assume that these methods and tools are applicable across the board and they, are, they work the same everywhere. So we are perhaps in some ways less cognizant of the need to bring our students' experiences and um, the discursive worlds that they inhabit into dialogue with the uh, methods and principles that we, that we uh, teach. In particular, when we teach a course, as I have done in all these um, institutions, um, uh, like a survey course in digital humanities, which is a kind of encyclopedic course, um, it's very easy, I think, to slide into a, a mindset of teaching a bunch of discrete tools and methods without necessarily trying to find a common thread running across them that could link up with the um, issues that concern our daily lives and that of our students. So in the next couple of minutes, I'll, I'll, I'll very briefly uh, uh, run through a few articles that uh, motivated uh, this, uh, this line of, of thinking that I described. Um, uh, Geoffrey Hartham in 2006, uh, uh, in an article, says that uh, not everyone can or should engage great questions directly, but all work in the humanities takes place in a context of concern for issues not directly reflected in the material under uh, consideration. So that is a kind of kind of indirect um, link that uh, often exists between our our um, extra academic concerns and our academic ones in in the classroom. Um, then um, Jonathan Lear, uh, writing in um, uh, uh, 2014, uh, talks about the notion of imaginative possibility. Our lives are shaped not just by what we take to be the case, but our sense of what is possible. And once imaginative possibility is opened up, then there is the room to make it into a practical uh, necessity. So. Um, so we, I, I, I'm, I'm going to make the case that we shouldn't make the digital humanities try um, to stand outside time and place, but instead we should try to create these conditions of imaginative possibility that enable uh, bringing it in dialogue with our, um, our uh, um, things that are happening in our lives and um, world. And finally, a question about particulars and universals. Rens Bodd, in his book published about a decade ago called, um, uh, I believe called uh, A New History of the Humanities, I forget the exact title, um, uh, mentions that the humani humanities, contrary to our um, received opinion that humanities is always about the particular, uh, we have, as humanists, always also been interested in looking for patterns and looking for regularity. But at the same time, um, there is the particular that is very much present in the humanities as in a way that perhaps it is not in the social sciences and the natural sciences, and that is a distinguishing feature of what we do. Now, this brings up a very interesting dilemma, which is that um, on the one hand, we are interested in the particular, and the most particular thing that we are familiar with is us, um, ourselves, but at the same time, why do we do the humanities? We try to do the humanities in order to speak to the other, to comprehend the other, and the other is not us. But there's a paradox there, which is that um, in order to um, 
attend to the other, we also need to understand ourselves, our own selves, because unless we do that, we would not be able to um, make ourselves uh, be put in dialogue with, with the other. So, so, so that means that there's a very peculiar thing going on here, I think, about uh, our relationship to the particular and in the digital humanities, which on the one hand is about seeking regularities, seeking patterns, doing macro analysis, how do we put that in dialogue with our own particularity is uh, a very interesting question. I have explored some of that in another article that I published in 2021, uh, in case um, it is of interest, and here is the reference to that. So thinking of patterns, um, patterns show up all the time in, um, in mathematics, in physics, in the natural sciences, and they repeat. Patterns are patterns because they repeat. But at the same time, there are patterns that are non-repeating patterns. There are certain mathematical properties. Uh, someone uh, at the University of Leeds uh, is researching that, um, you know, patterns that never repeat themselves but yet display some uh, discernible uh, regularities. So I, I think that's a good metaphor for thinking about humanities and especially digital humanities. There are these patterns, there are these regularities, but there's also this uh, this particularity, that non-repetitive, non-reactive thing that is within ourselves and in our students. So, um, that means, if, I'm, if I've convinced you uh, of, of this importance of the particular, even in the digital humanities, where would this particular show up in the classroom? Well, an obvious candidate is in content. When I teach in Singapore, the students in Singapore are reading Singapore literature. Um, they're reading about um, stuff that is being written in Southeast Asia much more so than my American students do, who are reading Western literature, American literature, European literature. So yes, that is true, that the, we can take the method, we can take the principle, we can take the tool and apply it to different kinds of content in different specific particular places. But today, I want to talk to you about something a little bit different. I want to focus today on what if we take this a step beyond just content? What if when we talk about the methods and principles and tools and techniques of the digital humanities, can we bring the particularity of local context, the specificity of local reference into our discussions of the principles and tools and methods themselves. And I think one way that we can do that is by our choice of metaphor. George Lakoff at the University of California uh, wrote a book a, a couple of decades ago called Metaphors We Live By, where he argues that everything that we do to think is in terms of metaphors. You know, metaphors is all we have to think and to teach and to learn. So what can we do, therefore, to um, bring the metaphors uh, into deployment in our teaching of the digital humanities and the rest of my talk uh, will be basically about what I have tried to do, metaphors that I have I tried to found, found useful in my uh, teaching, especially in Singapore. The kind of uh, organizing uh, metaphor that I have found interesting and useful is what um, in the social sciences in particular goes by the name of structure and agency. Anthony Giddens' book, uh, Central Problems in Social Theory, uh, th that kind of formally puts this out uh, as the structure in our world, but there's also agency in our world, the structure that determines, shapes, provides a kind of regularizing force, a normative force, but at the same time there's agency, individual agency that is uh, acting in a centrifugal way against that centripetal direction. So it occurred to me as I was teaching in Singapore that um, many of the tools such as topic modeling that was discussed just now, uh, um, uh, the new AI uh, techniques that are now becoming very, very popular, many of these things can be made sense of and can be easily communicated to the students in terms of what they're actually doing as uh, this kind of play, this kind of dialectic between structuring forces and uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, contravailing forces that are, are act in the opposite direction. So, so what I'm, what I'm suggesting here is that um, this notion of this kind of dynamic interplay between 
um, structure and agency between, um, between centralizing forces and decentralizing forces, this actually shows up everywhere when we look at it. And Singapore turned out to be a very fertile um, uh, arena for this metaphor. Why? Oops. Um, it turns out that, as you, m most of you are probably aware, uh, Singapore um, uh, is sometimes described as an authoritarian democ democracy. Um, it often, you know, projects itself to the world as a um, kind of Asian values, uh, the capitalism with Asian characteristics, as is sometimes called, um, it is called in, in, in East and Southeast Asia. So, in a very real sense, my students, I found in Singapore, are very aware themselves of these um, two opposing forces that are constantly impacting life and society everywhere around them. The centralizing force, uh, the, the kind of normative force that tries to regulate and, and fix and um, uh, control their uh, their uh, life trajectories and the uh, individual innovations and agencies that are also equally being recognized in Singapore as very, very important. Um, it turns out that in 2020, uh, the senior minister for um, uh, social policy in Singapore um, stated in, uh, in a uh, signed, uh, signed op-ed in the, the leading newspaper, unlike the old model of a certain conformity that East Asia was known for some time ago, the new model is about developing a streak of wanting to be different, but at the same time retaining a sense of togetherness in society, that you know, dynamic that opposite, reconciliation of opposites out in the, out in the open. And it turns out that we were in our grade books course at that time in, in, in Singapore, which all our students at, the, at ACDD had to take. We were teaching um, Lycurgus, who was the Spartan king, who uh, gave the Spartans their first constitution. He may or may not have been a real historical person, but um, that's a name that is associated with it. And uh, he said something kind of very, very similar to what Lee Kuan Yew, the first Prime Minister of Singapore, had, um, had famously enunciated in, in 1995. Uh, he, he stated, what a country needs to develop is discipline more than democracy. The exuberance of democracy leads to indiscipline and disorderly conduct, which is inimical to development. So from 1995 to, to 2020, things have changed. Why have they changed? If you look at this um, index of competitiveness. 2019-2020, Singapore is on top. It's the leading most competitive country in the world, but in the subsequent three years, uh, that has actually been on, the, on a somewhat downhill curve, and there is this growing awareness among our students that, as well in Singapore, that in order to be a thriving, successful uh, society, there needs to be room for innovation and individual agency, as well as structure. So, um, so there's this kind of hunt in, in Singapore. I realize that uh, actually is there everywhere around us in all societies and all countries about finding that sweet spot, the Goldilocks region where things are just right, where, you know, this conformism and non-conformism are, are in exact um, harmony, to, so to speak. Now, it turns out that Coming back to digital humanities, a lot of our algorithms um, and techniques and methods can be thought of as a variant of hill climbing. What is hill climbing? If you are looking for the optimum, in other words, you are trying to reach the peak out on your mountaineering expedition, you can't always just follow the path that seems to be leading higher and higher, because you might reach a local peak, you might hit a local optimum, and you might miss the global peak, the, you know, the, the uh, overall optimum. So when you are hill climbing, you are also exploring and sometimes doing counterintuitive things, such as going a little bit downhill, so that you don't miss the global optimum and get trapped on the local optimum. So, so that's the kind of 
metaphor that I think is, you know, we can draw upon that metaphor everywhere from the world around us, in every society, in every classroom, but um, that central, uh, central trope of, the, of hill climbing, I think, can be usefully deployed in talking about a lot of these uh, algorithms that we use in the digital, uh, digital humanities. So, uh, la last couple of slides, just some examples, and I'll be done. Um, uh, so ChatGPT, which is on everyone's uh, everyone's mind uh, since the last few months, now it turns out very interestingly that if you try to get ChatGPT to write fiction as opposed to non-fiction, it actually helps to relax the parameter that makes it predictive. You know, in 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 the settings of ChatGPT, if you are making it select the most highly predicted next word following the words that it has generated, that is not quite suitable for fiction. For fiction, we need more creative room, we need more room for exploration. Um, likewise, that introduces a danger as well, in other words, that if it's making an error, if it's going astray, then if you relax that parameter, then it could actually go more astray, and so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a danger, it's a risk, but it's a calculated risk that you have to take. Topic modeling, how topic modeling works, you know, um, I, I use this to teach my, um, teach my students about the uh, sort of underlying, underlying math, the basic idea is that the, um, uh, you are, uh, you, there are some parameters that you can tune to decide how much um, room you will give the modeling algorithm to come up with a model that finds more coherent, more tight topics as opposed to uh, giving it room to be a little more relaxed and, and more serendipitous, so to speak. Uh, likewise, with you know, generative adversarial networks, you know, the, the uh, underlying technology of a lot of the new AI, where you have this generative part of the AI, which is proposing candidate solutions, and the adversarial part of the network, which is like a really harsh editor that clamps down on you and 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 you know uh, that. Uh, hinders your creativity in a sense, but like all good editors, sometimes you need that discipline. So, uh, so th those are kind of uh, things that I found when I uh, hit upon that. It was really a kind of uh, very illuminating moment for me and my students, and uh, they, uh, they they reported uh, in their evaluations that it really helped them to uh, see what we were doing in a very integrated way. Thank you. <laughs>